So if you'd open your Bibles to uh, Genesis chapter 20, we'll get ready. Thank you for praying for me. Uh, well, um, <laughs> I'm in a little pain, but that's all right. <clears throat> so let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word this morning. Lord, it means so much to us to realize that the book that we hold in our hand was handcrafted by God. You chose every word, Lord, and every phrase, and you chose it with a purpose. And, and now, Lord, you want to speak it to our hearts this morning. So we pray, Lord, that as we come to your word, open our hearts, cause us to realize this is not just another book. This is God's words that proceed out of his mouth to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Genesis chapter 20, verse 1. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur, and sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said unto him, Behold, thou art but a dead man for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, Wilt thou, also, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she is my sister? And she even, even she herself said, she is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, and for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that is thine. Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told them these things in their ears, and the men were sore afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, What hast thou done unto us, and what have we offended thee, that thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought, surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they'll slay me for my wife's sake. And yet indeed she is my sister. She's the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. All right, so... Stop there. So in our last study, we came to know uh, this, this new person, very important person in the Bible, Abimelech. And in this chapter, what, what's happening with us is that we're being privileged to be brought into this intimate, heart-to-heart -heart conversation between God and Abimelech. And in verse 2, we saw that God is very careful to emphasize to us the magnitude of the sin of Abraham and how, he, and how God chose to identify uh, um, Sarah, as in verse 2, where it says, And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife that she is my sister, and Abimelech sent and took her. So as far as God was concerned, this was not just another woman for Abraham endangering her and calling her her sister. This was his wife. And because of that, Abraham caused Abimelech to sin. And Ab in other words, Abraham was the cause of Abimelech's sin. And Abimelech wasn't happy about that at all. And so we see in verse 9 where it says he calls to Abraham and he protests to him. He charges him. He, he says to them, what have you done unto us? And what have we offended you? What was the reason that you brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? And you've done things, that you've done deeds that ought not to have been done. And Abimelech was right. He was dead on right when he blamed Abraham because it was just as Abimelech had said to Abraham, Abraham, you brought on us a great sin. It's your fault, Abraham. And so Abraham had done this thing, as Abimelech put it, deeds that ought not to be done. And this was not the first time, as we've seen, that Abraham had done this. Abraham did this to Pharaoh king of Egypt, and Pharaoh told, and, and this, in other words, Abraham told the same lie to Pharaoh as he told to Abimelech as his sister, and Pharaoh, like Abimelech, gave the same protest to Abraham because he'd wronged him. And that we saw back in Genesis 12, 8, where Pharaoh called Abraham and said, what is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? So it's the second time that poor Abraham has to hear these searing words, what is this that you have done unto me? 
And they're hard words for poor Abraham to hear. Why? Because they're hard words because in both cases, Abraham has nothing to say. He has no defense. This, this flimsy defense that he comes up with with his sister, he would have been better just to not have said anything. But anyway, he's embarrassed. He's ashamed. And, and it's, it's a really bad position that Abraham finds himself in. And it's a bad position if we, when we find ourselves in that position also, where we sin and we cause others to sin also, as he did. Paul looked at his life and he said about himself, I never want to be in that position in my life. I never want to be in Abraham's position in Genesis 20 and Genesis 12. And so what happened is that when, when Paul was called in this council and, 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 and he was, there was his accusers that wanted his death, there was Felix who had the power to, to, to with one swipe of the hand, he, he, he becomes beheaded like John the Baptist and Herod. And what happens is that Paul now stands up and he speaks. And we see this in Acts 24, 15 through 16, where he says this. This is what Paul says when he's really in front of what is really going to determine whether he's going to live or die. And he says, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also lie, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscious void of offense toward, toward God and toward men. See, from these two verses, what we can see here in Acts 24 is that Paul is specifically thinking about his death. I mean, here he is. He, they want him dead. The accusers want him dead. Felix is going to decide whether he lives or death. So his, his life passes in front of him, so to speak. And, he, and what he brings up first, he talks about a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. And so this shows what's in Paul's mind. He's thinking about dying. He's thinking there's a very real possibility that this is going to be his last time in court, and he's going to die. And so he's thinking about that, and so he's very aware that his death is in front of him. He's very aware that this may be perhaps his last words. And so looking at that very real possibility, what comes to his mind? That, that there is, after death, this resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. And then he goes on to speak with that in mind and realizing that there's going to be a judgment after death. He realizes and then, and that, and then he says, you know, in light of that, I have put my life to a constant effort, a never-ending a never, never uh, um, exercise, and a struggle that I won't go in the inclination of my heart my heart wants to go in this way, but I won't. I exercise myself like he's at a constant 24-hour gym, <laughs> Paul is, you know. I constantly exercise myself. I pull myself back so that I can have a, what he calls a conscience void of offense towards God and towards man. See, he cares about his conscience. He's, he's, he's thinking about his conscience. You know, uh, Job had the same... Same, same uh, 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 endeavor. In Job 27.5, he wrote like this, My righteousness I hold fast and will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me as long as I live. That's the same thing. That's the same thing that Paul is saying. I exercise myself to have a conscious void of offense toward God and toward man. And Job says, my righteousness, I'm going to hold on to it. I won't let it go. I will not, my, I'm determined that my, my heart, he talks about, is not going to accuse me. My heart is not going to reproach me as long as I live. Now, what is this that Paul was talking about? Because in, in, in Romans 2.15, we have a description of the conscience. And in, the con, in, in that description, it's, it describes something very interesting where it says, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. So this verse tells us three things. First, it tells us what the conscience is. 
conscience is. And second, it tells us what the conscience does. And third, it tells us how the conscience works. Now, first of all, what is the conscience? The conscience is described here as the work of the law written in their hearts. The work of the law written in their hearts. So the conscience is the law of God that's written in our hearts. Just like what it says about the commandments that, that Moses brought down from Mount Sinai in Exodus 31, 18, it says, and he, God, and he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. See, that was how the commandments were characterized. They were written with the finger of God. And Moses was so impressed with this. He was so impressed with the fact that what he was carrying was written with the finger of God that when he was, he was giving one of those great rehearsings in the book of rehearsings, which is the book of Deuteronomy, and in Deuteronomy 9.10, he says, And the Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone, written with the finger of God. And on them was written according to all the words which the Lord spake unto you in the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. So Moses, he just couldn't get over it. He just was so impressed with the fact that what he was holding in his hands were tables that were written with the finger of God. And that was something. And if you stopped Moses, he's walking, he's got tables, and you stopped Moses, he says, Moses, what you got there? He says, I got stones which are written with the finger of God. And that's what he would have said, because that's what impressed him most about it. That was the big point for him in the stone. He said, I've got something that was written with the finger of God. I don't, know. I don't think I knew this verse, but anyway, before uh, Mount Sinai, before um, there were two hospitals in Los Angeles. You've all heard of Cedar sinai Well, it, originally it was Mount Sinai Hospital and Cedars of Lebanon. My dad used to practice at both of them, and so I used to get dragged along to these two hospitals. And Mount Sinai was in Beverly Hills, and... And uh, <coughs> Cedars of Lebanon was another place. But anyway, so we go to Mount Sinai Hospital, and down there at the bottom, there, as you come in, the Mount Sinai Hospital in L.A., they had, these, they had the Ten Commandments, you know, and they were there. And I used to put my finger in them as a little kid and said, this is God's finger. For <laughs> anyway, <coughs> those weren't written with the finger of God, but Moses were, the table of stone. It was all about, for him, written with the finger of God. And so, and, 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 and if you were Moses, and if you were Moses, and you were walking down with those tables of stone, wouldn't you feel the same way? Wouldn't you feel the same way? I've got something here that's written with the finger of God. This is really something. You know, I didn't sit in a class and take notes about this. I've got this right here. It's written with the finger of God. And so, you know, and, and, and we would treasure that. Like Moses, we treasured that. And, and it was written with the finger of God. And, and we'd honor it. We'd say this, I've got something written with the finger of God. And, 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 and the amazing thing is, is that what this verse teaches us in Romans 2 is that you and I have this, have this table within us that was written with the finger of God. And that's exactly what's meant in Romans 2.15 when it says, the work of the law written in their hearts. Who wrote it? The finger of God. God wrote that. It's the work of God. So that's what our conscience is. It's the, it's the work of the law written in their hearts. Now the next thing, what does the conscience do? Well, that reverse in Romans 2.15 tells us that the conscience is described as what is doing is bearing witness. It's a very court-like term, very legal term. It's like in a court, and the, the conscience is there, and it's swearing to tell the total truth and nothing but the truth, and it is telling the truth, and it's constant telling the truth, and he doesn't leave the witness stand. The, the, this conscience, and he's always speaking, and he's and, he, and he's being these, and he's a referee as he speaks, and he's 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 this, this work is described in Romans two fifteen as he keeps speaking. What is he saying? He's saying, I accuse that, I excuse that, I excuse that, I accuse that. He's constantly giving his calls, and he's saying, this is right, this is not right, and he stands on the sideline, and 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 when we do something, we kind of look up at the conscious, say, what was it? Was it good or bad? And the conscious tells us it was good or bad. That's the job of the conscious. And how does it operate? It says through their thoughts, either accusing or excusing. So all of a sudden, it's a thought that comes to us. Oh, that was not good. That was wrong. That was good. 
That's the thought. That's the interjection of the thoughts by the conscience. That's what it does. It's a thought that comes to my mind. It's a thought that comes to your mind that says that was good, that was bad. That's a conscience. That's what it's doing. Now, that's why the Bible speaks of a good conscience. In other words, if the conscience is there, making good calls, it's a good conscience. And then in 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul describes that to Timothy when he says, now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and faith unfeigned. And he also told him in, in verse uh, 19 of 1 Timothy 1, holding faith, hold on to faith, Timothy, and a good conscience. In other words, do the things so that you have a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. And as a matter of fact, Paul saw a good conscience as a state to live in. It's a place to be. And so that's why he told this council, he said, and Paul earnestly beholding the council, another one, another council, Paul went through a lot of counselors. <laughs> Poor Paul. Anyway, Paul, it says, earnestly beholding the council said, men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. So when the conscious that is spoken of is good, it means to be living in a state where it's not accusing. And then there's the bad conscience. You know, what, that was the classic place of that is when the woman was taken in adultery and the Lord said, he that's without sin, let him cast the first stone. Then they left from the eldest to the youngest. And why did they leave? It describes it in John 8, 9, where it says, and they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even the last, and Jesus left alone. So the word that, the, uh, the word <coughs> that describes the work of the conscience is a conviction. It's a convicting. You know, a convicting that makes the person drop his head in shame and embarrassment. It's exactly the picture we have here of Abraham in Genesis 20. He's got a bad conscience. His conscience is convicting him. He has nothing to say except for this lame excuse, which, as we said, he sh shouldn't have done that. And, 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 and when he said that lame excuse, then what happened? Then he has to endure uh, Abimelech's looks like you can't be serious. Anyway, so when the conscience is always making calls that it was evil in a person, and the Bible calls that an evil conscience. But the great thing about it having an evil conscience is what it says about it in Hebrews 10, 22, speaking of us, where it says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. So we all have an evil conscience. We all have been where Abraham is. Maybe not about our wife, but in some way we've lied or, 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 or done something where the conscience has convicted us, made us ashamed, made us embarrassed in front of God, in front of man. And we all find ourselves like that. And, and, and in, <clears throat> in the place where the conscience is described in Titus 1.15, with these words, unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving nothing is pure, but their mind and conscience is defiled. It's made dirty. It's soiled. And we want so much, when that happens to us, as Abraham did in the, in the case in Genesis 20, we want so much to, to return back, to get to that place that's described in Hebrews 13, 18. Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly. And <clears throat> we want to get to the place where it says in 1 Timothy 3, 9, holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience, good conscience, pure conscience. Sin makes that defiled conscience. Then there's a choice. Either get cleansed, as it says, 1 John 1, 9, or stop listening to the conscience, in which the Bible describes that in 1 Timothy 4.2, as a conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, when we find ourselves like Abraham, then we're, we're praying, as Abraham did, as David did in Psalm 51.2, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. That's why this verse in Hebrews 10.22 is so important because it tells us that, we're to, that we, we, we can come having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. 
Okay, <clears throat> now, what's the water? The pure water. That's the word that the Lord Jesus Christ speaks to us through the Bible, where he said in John 15, 3, now you are clean through the word, but it doesn't stop there. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. See? Now, <clears throat> that's the cleansing word of the Lord. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us. He cleansed us. He cleansed us with his word. He cleansed us with his blood. And when in Revelation 1, 5, where it says, Unto him, the Lord Jesus, who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. See the connection? Loved us and washed us. He loved us and he washed us. If he hadn't washed us, he hadn't loved us. What is our greatest need? To be washed from our sins. Therefore, the great love of God was to wash us from our sins. In his own blood, the emphasis is. In his own blood. And that, in contrast with Hebrews 9.12, neither by the blood, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, which he entered into once the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. That's what he did for us. That's what he's going to do for Israel. That's what he's going to do for the Jewish people. That's the whole movement of Je Jeremiah 33. About, uh, because there he states out with the I wills in Jeremiah 33.8, when God says, I will cleanse them. In other words, I'll wash them from all their iniquity, and whereby they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquities, whereby they have sinned, whereby they have transgressed against me. I will, God says, cleanse them. I will pardon them. That's the hope of Israel. That's the Hatikvah. Now, in verse 5, we can see that Abimelech now, he's pleading his cause with God, his case, rather, with God. And he says in verse 5, Said he not unto me that she is my sister? And she, even she herself, said he's my brother. So what Abimelech is saying to God is that he didn't know that Abraham's wife, uh, that, this was, that Sarah was Abraham's wife. And he tells God that not only did Abraham tell me he was a sister, but Sarah did too. She did too. And so what he's really saying here is that, wait a minute, I'm not guilty. I was just misled. And it shows us that shows us several things. Well, one thing it shows us uh, how complicit Sarah was in obeying Abraham and even in lying. And and uh, but Abimelech is just shocked to hear that Sarah is Abraham's wife. He had no idea. And it shows us something that that it, 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 he recognized it was a great sin. God told him he was going to die because of it, but he didn't even know it that it was a great sin. But it was still a sin. Even though he didn't know it, it was still a sin. Even though Abimelech was ignorant that he had sinned, he still had sinned. It was a sin of ignorance. Sin is a sin, whether a person knows it or not. It's still a sin. It's a very interesting picture here. Because what we see is a picture of Abimelech who didn't have any knowledge of God, and, and he sins in ignorance. And so what we see in verse 5 is Abimelech arguing to God that he didn't know. He says the integrity, he talks about the integrity of his heart and the innocency of his hands. He's done this. He calls his hands innocence. And all of this conversation is going on. And you know the amazing thing is, is this conversation is going on in the same dream. You know, it's like one night's dream. And, and in that dream, God responds back to him. Notice in verse 6, and God said to him in a dream. So God's responding back to him in a dream. And his response shows us something very interesting about God. It's in the fact that God makes this pronouncement, you're a dead man, you're dying. And then he's, he, he hears Abimelech's argument, and then he responds back to Abimelech. You know what it shows? It shows that God did not want to destroy Abimelech. He really didn't want to. Abimelech was lost in his sins. He was dying in his sins, literally. And God wanted to save Abimelech. Because this is who God is. When it says in Luke 9, 56, the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's life. The Son of Man did not come to destroy Abimelech's life. But to save them. But to save Abimelech. And so the Son of Man has come to seek and to save, Luke 19, 10, that which is lost. Seeking to save. 
And so when you look at the whole context around John 3, 16, it reads like this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might or should be saved. He that believeth in him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the condemnation. Light is come into the world. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So what we have here in these verses 3 through 7 is light coming to Abimelech. This is God. This is light. And so first of all, in verse 3, the light says, you are dying. That's the light that says that. Behold, thou art a dead man. And no one can be saved unless they understand that they have sinned, as, as in all have sinned of Romans 3.23, and come short of the glory of God. And no one can be saved unless they understand that the consequences of their sin is death. As it says in Ezekiel 18.20, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. And no one can be saved Unless they understand, verse 3, Behold, thou art a dead man. And if God only wanted to destroy Abimelech, he would have stopped there. He wouldn't have gone on. But he goes on in verse 3, and he says, For the woman which thou hast taken, she's a man's wife. See, verses 3 and 7, three, 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 and seven here, they show us that God did not come to destroy Abimelech. He came to save him. And he came to seek and to save lost Abimelech. And this is what it says, that <clears throat> for there's one God in, in 1 Timothy 2, 5, and 6. There's one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And he's the propitiation, it says in 1 John 2, 2. He's the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, all right, so at verse 6, God responds back to Abimelech with this, and God says two very interesting words, and, and, and it's in verse 6, it says, and God said to him in a dream, yea, and here's the two words, I know, those are the words, I know that thou hast done this thing in integrity of heart, I also withheld thee from sinning against thee, therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. So Abimelech told God he didn't know. And God said, I know you didn't know. I know. <laughs> I know. <clears throat> so that's interesting because it shows that God knows and he cares about what a person knows and what a person doesn't know. You know, I was, uh, sometimes <clears throat> used to fly into Ethiopia and you pass over these areas of Africa, you know, you know, Sudan and northeast part of Ethiopia, southern part of Ethiopia, very, very primitive places where they've never seen a white man. <clears throat> Some of them still don't wear clothes. And, <clears throat> you know, looking down over that, over all those things, I said, boy, look at all those people down there. I wonder if they ever heard the gospel. Are they going to perish without any hope? You know, in, in anything. You know, can God see them? Does God have the advantage of the Boeing jet to see them down there? <laughs> God, can you see them down there? <laughs> Calling God. You know, <clears throat> you know <laughs> because when, because this, these two words, that God said, I know. We can apply that to the heathen. He knows. He knows every single person that's born. See, when we say, when someone says, well, how can God know? That's speaking from man's limitation, man's limited point of view, even with his Boeing jet. He's limited, but God has the knowledge. He knows every single person, and he cares about his person, and he's not willing that any of them should perish. And, that, that, and, he, but he, and he's able, God is able, not only to know, but he's able to bring them the gospel without any limitation. And so what God said to Abimelech, I know, and notice then Abimelech now tells God, that, that, uh, uh, then he tells Abimelech, I'm helping you. I know, and I'm helping you. Well, how are you helping me? I'm withholding you from sinning against me. You know, I didn't allow you to touch her, is what he says. And so what is this? What is this going on here? What this is, is this is an illustration of Romans 2.4. It's the riches of God's goodness and his forbearance and long-suffering 
because the goodness of God is leading now Abimelech to repentance. It's leading him to repentance. It's the riches of God on Abimelech. It's the forbearance and the long-suffering of God on Abimelech. And it's the goodness of God leading Abimelech to repentance. And he's like, he's, God is like, he's taking Abimelech by the hand. He says, come on, let's go together. Come on, Abimelech, let me take you by the hand. Let me lead you to repentance. Abimelech, let me lead you out of the death of verse 3, thou art but a dead man, to the life thou shalt live of verse 7. And that's exactly what God wants to do with every man. And that's why 2 Peter 3, 9 is so important because it says that God is not willing that any should perish. He might not perish. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In 1 Timothy 2, 4, he'll have all men. He might have. He wants all men should be saved. All right. <clears throat> now, it's very interesting what God says to Abimelech in verse 6. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore have I not suffered thee to touch her. Now, God said to Abimelech, he's very aware of the integrity of being left's heart. It's a very interesting picture, because as we said, he did something wrong. Abimelech was sinned. Didn't know he sinned, but he still sinned. And what happens here is now God tells Abimelech something, and then he stands back and he waits for Abimelech's response. That's the way God deals with man. And so, is it, and so now, what Abimelech really symbolizes for us is the lost man. You could call him maybe a heathen. And just like Abimelech did something wrong, he took Sarah, the heathen sinned. And Abimelech didn't know they did something wrong, but the heathen don't know also. And he didn't know he did something wrong, and the heathen are also dying because of their sin. But just like God told Abimelech that something was wrong, God, through the consciences we've talked about, is speaking to every person, telling them, you've done wrong, you've done wrong. You're but a dead man, and you need to retrace your, your steps. Now, notice here how God told Abimelech what the issue was in verse 6. God said to him that uh, in a dream, that I know that you did this integrity of heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. See, God, said to, God had said to Abimelech that, what, that he held them back, and he said that he held them back not from sinning against Abraham. I mean, after all, it was his wife. Why not? Because it wasn't it Abraham's wife. I mean, after all, that Abimelech was, was, uh, had taken. Wasn't it a sin against Abraham? Well, it was a sin against Abraham, but first and foremost, it was a sin against God. And that's, so what's really shown us here by the way God put this, is that all sin is a personal affront to God. It's a personal sin against God. And that's what, but David saw in Psalm 51, 4, when he said, against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this great evil in thy sight. And that's what Joseph said to Potiphar's wife. There's none greater in this house, uh, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin, not against Potiphar, not against your husband, but sin against God, Genesis 39, 9. So God tells Abimelech, okay, I held you back from sinning against God, sinning against me. And then God says to Abimelech what it would have been if he had sinned against him. He said, Abimelech, you would have been, it would have been a sin if you had touched her, he says, if you touched her. You know, he didn't say take her. He didn't say if she'd become your wife, but he says, I suffered thee not to touch her. I find that interesting. You know, it seems so drastic, you know, touch, not to touch. You know, the Bible does say in 1 Corinthians 7, 1, now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. You know, we live in a culture of, of hugs, I mean, everybody's hugging everybody. There's a hugs. Everybody hugs. I don't like it. I, I tell ladies, don't hug me or you'll get fat. I tell them. <laughs> I tell them. <laughs> um, the, the moment of tension, you meet somebody, are you going to hug or not? You know, so I tell them, don't. And, and in Japan, it's so nice because in Japan, nobody hugs. <laughs> nobody touches. Nobody shakes hands. It's very nice, you know. They just bow. 
I remember one time we were at the Tokyo Hilton, and the, the person helping us to go in, the lady, you know, she, she, the, the doors would open, and you'd be there in the, in, the, in the elevator, and she would bow until the elevator door closed, you know. And so one time we were there, it, w it was broken, the elevator door, so it wouldn't shut. <laughs> so she kept you to bow and bow. <laughs> we finally told her at ease. Anyway, uh, <laughs> you know, one time, but well, this is the culture we live in, touching, touching, you know. In, in France, when we went to go visit our, our missionary, Re Rusty Young in France, when he was there, he had this church outside of, of Paris, and we come there to visit him in his church one Sunday morning, big church in Malay, and in France, the culture is all about kissing. It's not just one kiss. It's very confusing, one kiss, two kiss, three kiss, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> it's uh, which cheek. You know. So, you know, loud, noisy kisses, you know, all that. And so this used to irritate Cheryl so much. She didn't like it. So when she came there that Sunday morning and, and everybody was lined up to leave the church and, she, and they were all with the kissing and everything, and Cheryl didn't want it, so she, go, she comes up to, go, to the rest of you and goes, Hi, Rusty, she says, <laughs> she says, uh, Here's your holy handshake. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> now, right away, without any delay, or other words, God goes immediately to what Abimelech has to do to not die. And he starts that off in verse 7 with the word now. That's how he starts it. You read that. Verse 7. Now. It shows the urgency of the, of the matter. God was saying to Abimelech, there's just no time to delay right now, Abimelech. This is a matter of now. This is for now. The gospel is an issue of now. When a person has understood that he's a sinner, he's on his way to hell. When Abimelech understood that he was but a dead man, then doing what God says is a matter of now. Receiving the Lord Jesus Christ is a matter of now. That's why it says in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, that behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. That's why it says at the end of the, book, the Bible in Revelation 22, 17, the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him that heareth come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will let him take the water of life freely. So we get this picture. It's like nothing, nothing holding me back. Come, now, take. And God loves then to get to the next word of verse 7, which is the word therefore. See, God is wonderful because he has these therefores to the dilemmas of our life. You know, Satan's therefore is uh, curse God and die. <laughs> Just finish it all. But that's not God's therefore. God starts his revelation to Abimelech in verse 3 with this declaration, you're a dead man. And then he tells Abimelech, exactly what he's got to do. He's anxious. You can, you can feel the anxiety of God. He wants to get to the therefore of verse 7 because he wants to get to what do you need to do. This is what you need to do, Abimelech. And the real goal of God and what makes God so happy was that so he could get to the middle of verse 7 where it says, Thou shalt live. That's God. He loves to say those words. Thou shalt live. That's God's goal. Why? Because that's who he is. That's who God is. In Genesis 2-7, we saw that the Lord God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The breath of life came from God, and man became a living soul. And the Lord Jesus Christ said of God in Mark 12, 27, he's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. And in Romans 4-17, God who quickeneth, or who makes alive, the dead. In Ephesians 2.1, you, you, he says, hath he made alive. You were dead. You were dead in trespasses and sins. In Ezekiel 33.11, he says, Say unto them, to the Jewish people he's speaking, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? And so just as God had a therefore for Abimelech to be able to live, God has a therefore for us and for everyone to be able to live. And he makes it very clear that, as he did to Abimelech, he makes it very clear, Abimelech, you are on eternal death row. And that's the statement that God's making to every lost person. You are on eternal death row. It's not going to end 
when they pull the switch, make the injection, or do whatever they do, fire the shots. It's not going to end. You're on eternal death row. And so he comes to us. He came to Abimelech, and he said, therefore, here's the way of escape. And God came to us, and he says, here's the therefore for you, which was the cross. God's therefore for us was the cross. Cost God a lot to become a man, take on himself all of our sins, die on a cross for our sins. But that's why God did it, so that he could say to us, now, therefore, and present the cross. The cross was God's therefore. The cross was God's thou shalt live of verse 7. And so therefore it says, as we've already quoted here in John 3, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And you can plug in there, but should have eternal life. Should not perish, should have eternal life. And then it goes on to say that, that uh, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but should have or should have eternal everlasting life. See, twice in these verses, John 3, 15 and 16, we have these two shoulds, these shoulds. We have the shoulds. The first shoulds is that he wants us, is that man should not perish. He says it twice, should not perish. And as we said in, in 2 Peter 3, 9. And the second should is that man should have everlasting life, should have eternal life. And God was saying to Abimelech, Abimelech, carefully consider your plight, your doom. Carefully consider that you're on eternal death row. Carefully consider that and take the therefore that I'm offering you. Now, therefore, he says. And now he gives instructions which are very simple. Very simple. He says, just restore the man his wife. That's it. Restore the man his wife. That's it. So simple. It was something Abimelech could do. He could do this. There's no power for him to do it. It wasn't impossible. All that stood in the way of Abimelech doing that was his will. Is he willing to do it or not? That's the way it is with the gospel. The gospel is so simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Anybody can do that. All that stands in the way is a person's willingness or not. And then we see in verse 7 that God tells Abimelech, Abraham, he's a prophet. Now, this is the first time in the Bible that a person is actually identified as a prophet. Now, this is some scene. I mean, you think about this. All right, here, here, there, there's Abimelech. He's just said in verse 5, Abraham had lied to him. And, Abraham, and, and his whole defense before God is that because Abraham had lied to him, that he misled him to sin against God. And God never said to Abimelech, you got it wrong, Abimelech. <laughs> God never said to, to Abimelech, she's his sister. <laughs> you know, that was Abraham's concoction. Anyway, <clears throat> he didn't say that. But <clears throat> it's established it's stipulated that Abraham lied and caused Abimelech to sin. And then God directs Abimelech back to this person who lied and caused him to sin and says, he's my prophet. Now, but Abimelech at this point could have said, but he lied and he caused me to sin. And God would have said, yes, that's right, but he's saved. He's saved. He's wearing my righteousness. He's my prophet, as a matter of fact. You know, Abimelech could have said, that's your prophet? <laughs> you <wanna> <laughs> he says, I think you ought to go find another prophet. No, no, anyway. But he didn't say that. He said, this is an exact picture of what happens to us. You know, like Abraham, we sin, we lie. And we're ashamed and we're embarrassed. We come to God confessing and receiving cleansing and forgiveness. And the devil points to us and says to God, he's a lie. Look, he lied. Look at that. And God says, yes, he lied. Okay. But he's covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He confessed it, he's, he's got the cleansing and forgiveness, and then furthermore, he's a prophet. <laughs> and so now we see that God told Abimelech that he needed the prayer of Abraham. Not only a prophet, you need the prayer of Abraham. And here's Abimelech, he's talking directly to God, and, God, and Abimelech could have said to God, why do I need the prayer of Abraham? Why do I have to go to Abraham? I, I, you and I are talking together right now. Why do I need him to pray for me? And God has established that he was not going to hear this prayer for pardon, for cleansing, and for life unless it came from Abraham. That's what he established. And God would only hear and answer Abraham's prayer for Abimelech to have pardon and cleansing and life. That's exactly the way it is now. 
Exactly the ways. Abraham is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Abimelech is a type of lost man. The rabbis today say, we don't need an intermediary to go to God. We go directly to God. And God says, I don't agree. Very simple. Because God says in 1 Timothy 2, 5, there's one God, the Shema, and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And, and, God, and, and, and he speaks of himself, the Lord Jesus, in Psalm 2, 7. I will go ahead and declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And then in Job 9.33, Job said, Neither is there any daysman betwixt us that he might lay his hand on us both. In other words, man and God. Where is that person? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, He shall pray for thee and thou shalt live. A prophet is a person who speaks for God to man. A priest is a person who speaks for man to God. A prophet represents God. He speaks from God to man. A priest represents man to God. He speaks from man to God. The work of a priest is to step in between God and man. That's the work of intercession. So first, God has identified Abraham as a prophet, but now when God says that Abraham's going to pray for you, God is now identifying Abraham as a priest. And the way God put it was so simple, it's just, it's just so wonderful the way he put it in verse 7. He said, he'll pray for you, and you'll live. Just that simple. He shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And, he, and Abimelech gets it in his mind. I need Abraham to pray for me. I must get Abraham to pray for me. If Abraham prays for me, I'll live. If Abraham doesn't pray for me, I won't live. My life is dependent on the prayer of Abraham for me. And Abimelech says, Abraham to me is the he shall pray for thee and thou shalt live person. That's who Abraham is. I've got one job. Make Abraham happy. Or give him a thousand shekels or whatever they give him. Because he's going to pray for me, I'm going to live. And if he doesn't pray, I'm going to die. If I've got Abraham's prayer, I have life. If I don't have Abraham's prayer, I don't have life. And so Abimelech has a single focus on Abraham, the single focus is, and he's thinking to himself, you shall pray for thee and thou shalt live. You shall pray for thee and thou shalt live. Don't bother me, I'm thinking about this. He shall pray for me and thou shalt live. And those words, he shall pray for me and thou shalt live, tell the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is like Abraham. And just like Abimelech knew his life depended on making Abraham happy, eternal life is dependent on making the Lord Jesus Christ happy. That's exactly what it means in the last verse in Psalm 2. Kiss the son, in other words, make him happy, lest he be angry, which is the opposite of happy. <laughs> and ye perish from the way, which is what happens when he's not happy. When his wrath is kindled but a little, Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. So wisdom is to be like Abimelech and see the Lord Jesus Christ as the he shall pray for thee and thou shalt live person. And a person who saw this clearly was a thief on the cross. When he said unto Jesus in Luke 23, 42 through 43, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt thou be with me in paradise. A wise person is, sees the Lord Jesus Christ like Abimelech saw Abraham. He sees the Lord Jesus Christ as John 14, 6, the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. He sees him as 1 John 5, 11 through 12. This is the record. God's given to us eternal life. The life is in his Son. He that has the Son has life. He that does not have the Son does not have life. John 5, 40. You will not come to me that you might have life. John 10, 10. I am come that they might have life, they might have it more abundantly. John eleven twenty five. 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And anyone who comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, he won't turn him away. He will not turn him away because it says in Psalm twenty two twenty four 24, that he does not abhor the affliction of the afflicted. <clears throat> and, in, and, in, and, and in Job 6, 37, it, it, sorry, John 3, 6, 37, he that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. I won't do it. Praying for others to live is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ right now. In Isaiah 53, 12, the back, it says, the, the last verse, it says, he poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many 
and made intercession for the transgressors. What intercession? He's praying for them that they'll live. Hebrews 7.25, he's able to save them to the uttermost that come unto him by God, that come to God on him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And then we see that in verse 7 that God made a very strong warning to Abimelech and said, if you don't restore her, if thou restore her not, know thou that, that thou shalt surely die. And so he gives him a choice. God gives him a choice. He says, look, I've done so much for you. I've withheld you from sinning against me. I've spoken to you now in this dream. But I'm not going to force you to do this. This is going to be totally your choice. Your choice, Abimelech, if you refuse, God says, if you refuse, I've given you the power to refuse. And I've given you the power to choose. Then he tells these terrifying words. The last time we heard those words was in Genesis 2.17. And the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. If thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die. And that's the way it is with lost sinners. That's how God deals. He offers life. He offers life. And he goes to many lengths to persuade, to convince. And he puts Christians in the pathway. And he convicts the heart of sin. And he foils the plan of others to sin. And he makes the way of the transgressor hard. And Paul said, he said to Paul, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. What pricks? The ones that God put in his way. But there comes that time, as he did here with Abimelech, when God steps back and says, okay, make your choice. Your choice is your choice. We'll record it, we'll honor it, and you'll determine your destiny. Life in heaven or eternal death in hell. And that's the way it is. And so therefore, he says to the Jewish people in Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, he says, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that thou and thy seed may live. And that's who God is. God is the I have set before you, God. He sets before life and death. And then he advises like crazy, choose life, choose life, choose life. And he persuades and does everything he possibly can. But then finally he comes to the time and says, like he does here to Abimelech, your choice, Abimelech, comply or refuse. And if we're faithful, as the prophet evangelist, we'll do the same. We will set before the lost in very clear terms God's offer, life or death. And we'll use all our powers to persuade and to convince and do everything we can, but then there's a time when we have to, like God, back off and let the person make their own free will decision. And that's what God's doing here in Abimelech. And in verse 7, God is saying to Abimelech as we close, the choice is yours. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for being the God of life. Thank you, Lord, for being the God of persuasion. Thank you, Lord, for being the God that withholds, that speaks, that, that, speaks that, that says you know that all the things that you do. Thank you for being the God who says no one should perish and everyone should have life. We thank you for that as we've seen this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.